Welcome to this uh, online, sometimes called virtual meeting. Uh, most of you are staying at home here in this meeting, like I have been doing in recent days, came to the office today to participate in hosting this meeting. Before I go into the results, we are all dealing with the same. Um, you are sitting now in front of the screen at home. Please don't sit there for 10 hours. Move, exercise, and take care of yourself, families, and etc. We are here in the long run. It's a marathon with intervals, this situation. Maybe as well, before I go into the, the, the result, but it's so interlinked with the results. It is a change of way of living. Uh, in the middle of the day, off, off season in the shops, I will go now myself, my wife will go in the other time of the week, shopping. Hopefully for now uh, three days shopping. Uh, we are planning to have a great salmon tonight. Uh, the kids have request, request pizza tomorrow evening. And of course, I, I'm demanding to have my rib pie on Saturday evening. So buying the lettuce, buying the, the, the vegetables uh, and everything with it in a one go shop, having a balanced diet through ready made, ready, or ready to cook products out in the groceries. This is the world we are living in now, and it's a dynamic world. It is the consumers are moving very fast now into and request of high quality, availability and affordability. We are partnering with our customers in making this happen and, and the demand is high now for consumer ready products. But what is a really, really nice model, we are full line offering seamless flow from post farm all the way to this part of, of the final products. And we are innovative, reliable, but we have two really, really strong X factors. It's our digital platform that is changing the industry from supply driven to demand driven to reduce the waste. And we have the global reach. It would be unthinkable how we deliver such results without having local teams in every continent around the globe with a strong global support. And we are stepping up, although we have invested very well, in our inf infrastructure, in our innovation, and, and etc., to continue on this path. The speed is such that we are moving in few months, uh, last months and next months, what we thought we would do in next years. So fascinating time, although many are dealing with the, the, the health and etc. We are dealing with safety, safety first in everything we do, but we are having resilience business. So we are pleased, we are humble, and we are upbeat when we look at, at the outlook. Order intake. Uh, in third quarter and year to date is on par with last year. There is m a little bit currency effect negative in it, but we don't look at that uh, quarter by quarter on, or in the long term. We are more or less naturally hedged here in Marel, and we see order intake, that is the most important, despite the turbulence is on par with last year. At the same time as the pipeline, demand is building up for more optimization, more flexibility out there. However, nothing is new under the sun. Economic uncertainty are, and timing of orders are, are not certain, and it can move between quarters. What I'm really pleased with in this quarter and recent two quarters, uh, uh, seeing how resilient we are, despite we are seeing revenues going down, seven eight percent this quarter we said with all our people it's a it's a marathon it's a marathon with intervals please take the summer holidays rest we don't have a, a serious delivery problems on the contrary our delivery performance has never ever been better than this year after we wrapped up space inventories and etc so take the summer holidays take the seasonality we are not going to replace it with temporary people this quarter, we go 78% down in revenues, but we keep 39% gross profit that we are very used to to see, and our midterm targets are 
Here it is the mix and the delivery performance that is driving that results. OPEX mainly sales and marketing cost is down. As in second quarter, pandemic is taking that uh, we, mobility is much less with uh, travel restriction and, and etc. However, it is as well accelerating, like I said, the way of working we really want to go. It is having local resources in every continent. It is a bit yesterday to fly in, fly out when you have a remote and virtual tools to assist your teams on the ground. And it is as well yesterday to think that you can sit in Europe, understand the customer needs and, and be able to deliver right quality on right time in China, in Asia, in LATAM and sit here in Europe and prepare that. We need to have customer intimacy, be close to the customers and deliver what is requested or dream with them what are the future setups so we can make the consumer products I was talking about the beginning that is fitted for the market. We will continue in our strategic move. We take on acquisition in third quarter. We close it in fourth quarter. I will do that after Linda go through the financial, go deeper into Thrive. However, it is the dedication of the team, it is the vision, it is the margin, it is the cash flow that is making this dream a reality. Net debt leverage 1.1 after, after the uh, post the acquisition. Uh, so third, third quarter, year to date, more or less the same story with the exemption that in fourth quarter last year, first quarter this year, we had a temporary dip in uh, our uh, profitability. There it was Africa swine flu and later on the trade constraints. It is interesting how we dealt with it. We said, let's use this to accelerate our journey in globalization. Don't take any shortcuts here. And when the pandemic came that nobody could prepare for, it is in reality the same medicine that you are using in operation to deal with it. Looking at our industries, poultry once again delivering fabulous execution, good mix, aftercare revenues very high, profitability north of 20% in the quarter, very strong quarter in taking beginning of the year, bit softer in third quarter. Many of you have been watching, are you going to keep the run in the poultry? I can tell you the pipeline is building up and we are crystallizing very good orders in beginning of fourth quarter. All the timing of orders is uncertain. However, it is the most resilient or most easiest to cook uh, item here in the pandemic when we are rebuilding our, our, our capabilities. In, in, in cooking at home or, or learning it first time. Uh, for instance, here in the canteen, we have, have chicken milanese in the lunch time, just to pinpoint here, and, and I hope the factory guys like it very much in this lunch time. So it is a very, very, very affordable and convenient. 20% EBIT. We are having more or less 8% EBIT in meat and fish in this quarter, although it's calculated 7 or 8 plus. That is not in line with our future targets. However, we see a strong quarter in taking meat. We see as well the mix improving after quite significant downturn in the African uh, swine flu. As well, you see in uh, our financial that it's only 9% revenues from, from Asia, China in this quarter, and that's the Africa swine flu. Now the orders are picking up, and China is beginning for transformation. After after consolidation in the farming and need for modernization, and fish is on, on, on seven, eight percent EBIT. However, I'm surprised that the fish that is relying so much uh, on the restaurant chains, not fitted overall to deal with the, the, the grocery shopping, when Marel has full line solution that can secure bone free, a delicious ready to cook fish, why are people still in a wait and see game when, when you cannot wait and see? There will be less mobility next year than we are used to. There will continue more shopping in the groceries than we are used to compared to restaurants. 
So it's not a wait and see game. We have the solution and we should move on in partnership, uh, making the fish equal to the poultry and, uh, 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 poultry and meat in, in the groceries. Over to you, Linda. Yes, thank you, Altni. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for calling in. Uh, so I'm going to take you through the highlights of uh, Q3 uh, 2020. And it's with pleasure to go through the numbers. Uh, I think it's, uh, we're very happy to deliver a good quarter in the middle of the pandemics. And a uh, few things I want to highlight before I go into the details on the slides. Uh, on the order intake level, uh, as Anne pointed out, both uh, in the quarter and year to date, we are on par with uh, last year and we have managed to maintain a healthy order book. You do see uh, the visibility and, and uh, the timing is slightly impacted by the pandemic, but, uh, but maintaining a healthy order book in this period is, is, is good. On the revenue front, uh, we see uh, revenues declining, uh, both in the quarter, uh, quarter on quarter, like quarter uh, three 2020 compared to quarter three 2019 by around 8% and then around 7% if I look at the year-to-date numbers. Uh, our manufacturing sites have been open during this period, and, but they have not always been on full utilization levels. Uh, so that, uh, of course, has high attention on our end, but uh, good delivery uh, to our customers at the same time. Um, then if I look at uh, the aftermarket, that is now at a level of 41% in the quarter, uh, around 40% year-to-date. And there we see growth uh, in aftermarket uh, year to date around uh, 5%, uh, driven by the spare parts business because uh, the service uh, part has been impacted by that uh, there is limitation uh, for uh, field service engineers to get to our customer sites, but good growth in, in, in spares. Uh, then on gross profit, 39.2% in the quarter, uh, positively impacted both by uh, the mix, but also by good product execution. Uh, so very good to, to see that. Uh, leading to good profitability, EBIT in the quarter of 15.4%, uh, 12.8% uh, uh, year to date. And there you also see positive impact from the cost levels being at similar levels as in Q2. So we are still seeing less travel, uh, virtual exhibitions instead of uh, uh, the live one uh, compared to uh, before the pandemic. So. Uh, good profitability and, of course, like uh, also positive impact from the streamlining activities uh, earlier in the year. Cash flow strong, uh, free cash flow 36 million uh, in the quarter, leverage 0 0.5 before the acquisition of Thrive uh, and 1.1 after the acquisition of uh, Thrive, uh, which we concluded on uh, 8th of October. Uh, and, uh, Great addition to the team. We welcome uh, the Thrive team on, on board and it will be exciting to uh, continue uh, the journey uh, uh, together. Uh, on the people part, um, I think there's a lot to say about it, but uh, just to uh, touch on it shortly, like I think our team is uh, doing good, uh, uh, excellent uh, delivery. Uh, people are really thinking outside of the box, uh, thinking in solutions, like uh, coming up with new ideas, how to solve things uh, every day. So I think it has been a real pleasure to follow that. Of course, we see people getting tired of the situation, but that's something we are uh, carefully uh, following. And, uh, but overall, uh, excellent unity in, in dealing with uh, the situation. Uh, so if I move into the slides, uh, good quality of earnings, like this is like one of the very important points, especially in periods like this, that you have the diversified revenue streams, uh, you have the balanced mix, and, and you see here on the slide both the industry mix, the geographical mix, and, and the business mix. And if I touch on the industry mix, like poultry is now 55% of revenues uh, up from last year. Uh, we are, of course, very much focused on also uh, strengthening the fish part, which is now 12%, and the meat part that is now 31%. And we will see impact already next quarter on that when uh, Thrive uh, comes into our, our books. Uh, revenues by geography, geographies, uh, there you see that uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa is going up, while Americas and Asia and Oceania are going down. Uh, on the Americas, like if I look at the order book, we have some solid orders in uh, from that region, so we should expect uh, uh, good revenues there uh, in uh, affecting results in Q4 and in 2021. Um, then 
on Asia and Oceania. This is, of course, a region that we are very much focused on strengthening. Uh, as Adne touched on in the beginning, I mean, we had a, a real shock there on the order intake, and we haven't fully recovered from that. Uh, but it is clear to us like that uh, a lot of opportunities. Uh, we really need to revamp the full value chain there, and we see uh, increased investor attention and uh, also uh, some orders coming in. Uh, but I would say, like overall, that will more affect uh, us uh, on the revenue side in, in 2022. Um, then on the business mix, aftermarket now 41% compared to 37% uh, last year. We see growth in aftermarket, 5% year to date, uh, while uh, the project business is, uh, uh, yeah, is, is going down uh, compared to last year. Um, then on the order intake and, and the revenues, uh, orders received on par in, uh, for the nine months 2020, as well as the quarter. We had orders of uh, 282 million in the quarter. Um, revenues then uh, at the level of 287 million, 8% uh, lower uh, compared to uh, last year, uh, but colored by seasonality and, and uh, the pandemics. Uh, and then, again, to highlight uh, revenues from off the market, around 41% of uh, revenues. Um, operation <coughs> operational uh, performance. Uh, here you see uh, good product execution and uh, good product mix uh, positively impacting the gross uh, profit margin at the level of 39.2%. We also see positive impact on the gross profit from uh, utilization of our field service engineers, which is uh, improving uh, between quarters. Um, then, uh, again, contributing to good uh, uh, EBIT is uh, the OPEX being at similar levels as in, in Q2. So we see more focus on online solution, less travel, etc., as we did in, in Q2. Uh, SGNA now at the level of 18.2%. Uh, our midterm targets are 18%, so they look quite close in the in the quarter. But there is still uh, work to do there. Uh, we will be focusing on strengthening the front line while streamlining the back end, and also grabbing opportunities from uh, learning from the new ways of working. So that is our, our focus at the moment. R&D 5.6% in the quarter. Uh, our uh, plan there is to continue to invest around 6% uh, in uh, innovation, and uh, this is returning EBIT of 15.4% uh, in, in Q3. Um, then on the order book, uh, it's at a good level, 434 million. Uh, we started the year on uh, 414. Uh, we see that uh, the trailing 12 months, it's 36% it's, uh, of trailing 12 months uh, revenues, and the book to bill ratio is 0 0.98. And if we look at the year to date, book to bill, it's uh, 1.02. And as highlighted before, uh, these are financially secured uh, orders. Um, earnings per year. Um, here, like uh, our plan is to grow earnings per year faster than revenue, so uh, we are like very focused on that as a target. Uh, cash flow uh, is strong. It's uh, free cash flow, 36 million in the quarter. We are investing a part of that back in the business to build up for uh, fu the future. Uh, what we are also focused here on is like very disciplined capital allocation. We have re returned uh, around 100 million to shareholders this year. And uh, we will continue focusing on that. Also, uh, focusing on the M&A part, uh, Thrive now in, in uh, coming in in Q4, uh, which uh, should help us on this journey on delivering on this uh, this target. Uh, you can see here, like in, in the picture, that uh, we did have uh, some difficult quarter result-wise in Q4 2019 and, and Q1 uh, 2020. Uh, and this is trailing 12 months, so it does take a while to uh, change, uh, change the trend, but this has our uh, uh, clear focus. Also focusing on the margin improvements uh, in the business. Uh, then the income statement here, you can see revenues 287 million, 8% uh, uh, down uh, from last year. Uh, slight uh, tailwind on the revenue side uh, from uh, currency, uh, while we have some uh, um, positive impact on, on the cost uh, items uh, from, uh, from currency. And uh, you can see adjusted EBIT 44 million, 15.4% uh, uh, compared to 14.2% uh, last year. 
Uh, cost levels are lower in, in Q3 uh, 20 than uh, we saw last year, both absolute and, and uh, in percentage. Net finance cost 3.2 million compared to 2 million last year, uh, also impacted by uh, FX income tax 8.7 compared to 6.2 million last year, and that result uh, therefore 29 million in Q3 2020 compared to Q3 uh, 2019. Uh, so like one item to mention here uh, on the income tax part, uh, on, on the taxes in the Netherlands, there has been quite some long discussions on, on the tax levels there, like uh, it originally started uh, uh, in, in 2018, affecting our results positively, uh, because then the plan was to decrease uh, tax rates from 25 to 20.5%. Then again, last year, uh, they, uh, Plant, uh, they delayed that decision and uh, changed the percentage, so it had some negative impact last year, and we are expecting it to have a negative impact on the tax line again in Q4, roughly 6 million, if uh, the decision in the Netherlands will be to uh, not to decrease the tax rate there. So that's still pending, but will come in most likely in, in Q4. I mean, there is, in general, a lot of discussions around taxes in, in the world, uh, uh, so it will be interesting to follow also what will happen in other areas on, on this topic. Uh, Midterm targets uh, here, gross profit, uh, we are striving for 40% uh, in the midterm. Uh, as an M, we want to see around the level of 18%, but as I explained, even though we are at 18.2%, we still have some work to do there. We need to change a bit the mix. Uh, uh, grabbing opportunities now from changed ways of working, but also investing in the front line and streamlining the back end. Uh, R&D, we will maintain around 6%. Uh, balance sheet, uh, very minor things here to mention, like uh, we see uh, on the inventory side, we have been focused during the pandemic to make sure we have uh, available parts, so there is no delay in, in our delivery. Uh, you also see some uh, tr improvement on the trade receivable side, good collection both in the quarter and year to date, and uh, we have uh, then used part of the cash position to repay into our revolver. On, on the balance sheet side, leverage 0 0.5, 1.1 after the acquisition of uh, Thrive that will come in in Q4 into our numbers, and the secured liquidity uh, of uh, 729 million and we are fully funded until 2025. Uh, cash, flow, uh, uh, cash flow from operating activities, 54 million. We take, pay uh, taxes in the quarter of 2 million, mm -hmm. which is lower than earlier quarters, but uh, that's to do with uh, timing. We paid more in the beginning of the year. Investment activities, 15 million, so free cash flow, 36 million in the quarter. Uh, paying interest of 2 million, dividend payment is the tax part of the dividend, uh, 5.8 million, and uh, decrease in net debt of uh, 20 million in the quarter. Um, yeah, and to summarize, like, I mean, those are the key performance metrics we are constantly focusing on, uh, the earnings per share, uh, focusing on disciplined capital allocation and uh, margin expansion, the free cash flow, where we are losing, using part of that uh, to uh, invest in our business for the long term, and then the leverage, which is like well uh, within our uh, or below our targeted capital structure. Uh, so there is still room after the acquisition of uh, Thrive to uh, continue on our uh, growth path. So I give the word back to, to Aldne. Yes, uh, thank you, Linda. And, and I have to underpin how proud I am to be part of Team Marl. So uh, dedication. Uh, unity, excellence, innovation, our core value, we are showing it this year and always. I'm as well humble when I look at the partnerships we are having with our customers in those turbulent times, how we are striving to transform, become more agile, and our suppliers. Uh, so I want to show you here, uh, maybe unusual in, in this quarterly, that we have links here to show a new way of working, and you can click on it, what we have been doing. It's insight in what we have been doing this year. And, and it is about our global reach, for instance. It is about our digital platform, our X factors here. And you can click on it, see how our people are working next to their customers out in the field 
without traveling, being local, so important. Uh, this year, uh, we are in a very good position because we have invested systematically in our infrastructure and innovation. We have taken as well few very, very important decisions this year where we then in united executed here in the, the company. We started, so first of all, we needed to close, uh, for instance, in China in, in last week of January. That was a awakening call due to the pan pande that later became pandemic. But we saw then that many suppliers, or moreover, suppliers or suppliers could enter into trouble. We started to test the system, and due to our financial strengths, we refinanced the company in end of January, long-term financing. Then we started to ramp up inventories in spare parts, in manufacturing parts, and etc. Then, then, as early as 3rd of March, we took decision to cancel all conventional trade shows this year. Why is it so important to be speedy in decision in this time? It is because otherwise we have entered into the cost. We would have sent the equipment to the shows. We would have booked the flights and etc. etc. We could unwind it. But what is even more important, we could turn the focus on the virtual trade shows. And it has been fascinating to see the virtual trade shows this year. And if you don't, for instance, understand fully our digital platforms, our digital products in NOVA, I challenge you to click on and go to the uh, uh, software know-how, look into it. Whitefish show off, for instance, we had 500 customers for two days with us, very dedicated going step by step. Instead of the Brussels show where we would have had 2,500 customers, maybe stopping on average half an hour. Personally, do I believe this is the way forward? Yes, definitely. Much more intimacy with our customers. Uh, recap our, our history. We are a growth company. Uh, it was and is pretty immature business in optimization overall the food, the basic food industry. That's what is fascinating. We can continue to, to, to evolve and transform. We have been growing uh, plus 20% a year, two thirds with acquisition that support the organic growth. Moreover, it makes us better one-stop shop for our customers. Maybe to underpin as well, when we are taking acquisition, we are learning, we are always learning. Scanvect coming on board 2006 to mention one. They had 30% aftercare revenues. When Marel that was focusing on selling new equipment, solution had only 10%. We immediately learned service level agreements, how to take care of the customer better and etc. To mention one another one, Stork 2008, standardization modularization. We thought we were in standardization modularization, but oh my God, the, the Lego bricks that the, the Dutch were doing for so long time and talking about the global reach they had in the poultry industry, matching this together, bringing the digital know-how from, uh, from us here in Iceland into this global reach standardization. That's the magic when we are learning, when we listen to each other and when we listen to our customers. Moving to Thrive. I saw Thrive and Team Thrive and the solution of Thrive first time 2006. It was a wow effect. Their dedication for quality and right quality on right time is such. They are at, at and have been at the forefront in, in portioning, slicing, dicing, both in the meat industry bread and, and the bread industry. Very interesting shop channel from small butchers to the biggest retailers in the world. As well, very good entry point into the, the meat factories, as well as the, the full lines in cutting, where we can add now sensoring, bone free, for instance. We can add weighing technology. We can add the overarching software that goes all the way into live animal handling through the primary processing, and then cutting, sensoring, 
consumer ready out there in the shops or in the restaurants. This is what we are doing, enhancing our full line offering. We see quite many geographical potentials, for instance, Oceania, China, LATAM, where we are stronger together. After care revenues, we can drive them up as well. Looking at going forward, when the second consultation wave is clearly starting, and it's not only starting due to the pandemic, but it's a awakening call as well. We are only interested in innovative, reliable, and most of them are standard modules providers. Innovative, reliable. We are innovative, reliable as well, but we have two X factors that is an interest for those companies. The global reach and the digital platforms. I will never say this too often. They are as well facing uh, generation shifts, uh, succession, and etc. So I believe we are pretty attractive partners. What we say with the counterparts is as well, talk to the families that have joined us. Talk to the family in, in Sulman. Talk to the family in Maya. And hopefully we will say as well, after two years, talk to the family and tribe. More important even talk to the combined people. Are we listening? Are we working together? Those companies have 30 to 200 million in revenues on average, 100 to 800 uh, 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 employees, but their main focus is Europe, USA. When the market is turning global and it's turning to aftercare maintainers partnership, most of those, those companies are having 15, 20% in aftercare revenues. We are having 40. So I hope this gives insight into what we are doing. We strongly believe that we can still mature, enhance our full line offering, and we can accelerate the growth. If you don't accelerate the growth, you don't stay as a global leader. As a global leader, you can continue to innovate. You can continue to serve better. And listen to me. I say we are global leader. That is true in the industry. It's a base industry, poultry, meat, and fish and we are only having 1.3 billion in revenues. We need more scale, and we will continue to grow. More important is we see it as a seamless flow, at least our equipment and solution, from post-farm to dispatch. Remember, we started in the middle of the process. Our fortune has been to gradually grow, not eat the elephant overnight. It's building as well, lowering the risk, the global reach, optimizing the manufacturing footprint, focusing on the advanced and high-tech, and the game is first to improve the yield, 60 to 80 percent, for instance, the fish. We need now to cast three fishes instead of four. Now it's changing with the overarching software, the industry into demand-driven. Why should we have discounts on Monday, or why should we have waste when we can change to demand-driven instead of supply-driven? So this is fascinating world, and we will co continue to to, to grow and become better, it's not unlikely that the software needs to go from the DNA of the grain to the plate. At least I, you, and most consumer want to get the full traceability from beginning to end. Our targets remain 2023-2026. Some of you will say, is it not too ambitious? Others will say, why are you not having more ambitious 23 when you're already in SG&A 18%, for instance? We have said some of the cost will come back when mobility increase, but then our service revenues will as well tick up. However, there will be not say mobility 2021 beginning, uh, already cancellation we see of trade shows in beginning of the year. So we are accelerating our digital journey. We are investing more than ever. So Let's see, we are targeting at least to keep the cost levels there. We are targeting on delivery performance, keeping the gross profit. It's clear 16% EP target. Our long-term targets are clear to grow 12% a year since 2017 to 2026 with EP margin expansion. How are we doing? Are we on track? Yes, we are on track. We have been growing 6% in the first 40% of this period. Fortunately, we did not go on a buying spree in recent two years. We are 1.1 times leverage post the Thrive acquisition. 
we will continue to be disciplined in capital allocation. We are financially strong, and you know as well, there has been turbulent time in Africa swine flu, trade constraints, uh, and now the pandemic. We are keeping the pace, and there is a pent-up demand. There is more need for optimization or flexibility. So definitely we are on track. And I have said in-house, and I will say it again, the journey toward our goals now is much shorter than our goals that we announced to the six to reach one billion from 130 million and improve step by step quality of earnings. Let's turn to Q&A. Okay, just as a quick reminder, you can also email questions to ir.morel.com. Uh, but let's start with the online audience and I'll hand over to the conference call moderator. Thank you. If you wish to ask a question, please dial zero 01 on your telephone keypads now to enter the queue. Once your name is announced, you can ask your question. If you find your question has been answered before it's your turn to speak, you can dial zero 02 to cancel. So once again, that's zero 01 to ask a question and zero 02 if you need to cancel. And in the interest of time and fairness, if you can limit yourselves to one question and one follow up per turn, that would be appreciated. There will be a brief pause now whilst we register your questions. Our first question comes from the line of Klaus Berlinde of City. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Um, yes. Hi, Arne, Linda, Tina. It's uh, Klaus from City. So um, the first one is on poultry. Can we, can we talk about the regions a bit more where this short-term weakness came from. I, I hear you on the order pipeline still solid, orders are increasing in October, but I still want to understand this better. Why did we see the weakness? Was this positive effect from COVID, I increase in convenience, affordability, and so on, leveling off? Or is it, was it a particular customer pushing orders to the right? It would be great to understand, Arne, a little bit better on, on the poultry side. Yeah, class, uh, class, thank you for the question. Uh, poultry, very profitable, very important that we keep the, the rhythm there. Uh, excellent mix, excellent execution. Uh, we say it a little bit softer in third quarter, although it's higher than third quarter last year, just to underpin that. And we are comparing a very strong beginning of the year, for instance, Bell and Evans in USA, and a very good spread in mix. Uh, However, revenues uh, and the flow has been a bit under our expectation in, in, in America and Asia this year, while Europe has been a bit stronger. We are seeing that uh, pipeline, though, not changing at all in, in, in US, for instance, and we are seeing crystallized order intake in beginning of fourth quarter in USA, particularly. So, so Operation is fully covered in uh, fourth quarter in, in poultry and uh, as well in beginning of the year. Pipeline good and we are seeing orders turning in. But third quarter was higher than last year, just to underpin that in poultry. Very strong order intake in meat that was uh, softer in second quarter. So it's a timing matter. It's, uh, we, are, we are full confidence in, in the poultry business and the need for continuing automation. Maybe more interesting as well, we are starting to see uptick in China, both in meat, meat mm. and poultry. Okay, thank you. Um, my my follow-up is on is on services, and I'm trying to understand, uh, which it, it, it's all very good, but I'm trying to understand why the, why the spare parts are increasing like this. It's driving a good mix. Is it because of your own execution? You've been better in terms of building stock, increasing availability, or are you winning more with customers or is production increasing? Because utilization hasn't really recovered all the way back to the previous peaks. I just want to understand that. Yeah, so probably there are first uh, external factor that there is a huge shift from, from the food service into groceries. And if you are a provider with 20 factories and you need to minimize the output in the QSR factories into the grocery factories, then you have to ramp up as well different spare parts to deal with the, the uh, fluctuation. Then we ramped up our spare parts to improve the delivery. And you know, even though we are one-stop shop, then we, we never have the full share of the wallet. We believe that we regained our fair market share in this turbulent time. 
Some of third party providers are as well providing into automobile and etc. And they needed to close factories and etc. While we had a full availability of space and improved deliveries compared to the previous years and having local teams to install. So we are having quite many X factors that th this year. Our hope and our aim is that it is a permanent increase uh, uh, market share in, in the spare part, and then we will get the, the service revenues. We still have a low share of the wallet in, for instance, China. It used to be 10 years ago that the willingness was less to make the service level agreements. Now the willingness is, and we need to ramp up our local resources. So just, I hope this gives insight Focus, focus, focus on the aftercare business. We escalate every single delivery problems, even at the highest level this year. And I think that has paid off in an in a increased delivery performance. But even more important is the dedication and focus of our people in the, for instance, warehouse and logistics that we are focusing on. Okay. Uh, a very quick final one, I promise. It's on, it's on cost control and, and for you, Linda. Um, you're around 18% SGNA the last two quarters, which is your midterm target. And I guess this will increase again here in 2021 until we fall back to 18% again by 2023, which is your mm -hmm. midterm ambition. Or do you think there is upside risk to the OPEX now, uh, given what you've seen through the pandemic? So uh, I think like where the opportunity lies is that like that we grab part of uh, the savings we've seen in, in the recent quarters, like uh, with the change ways of working and, and less travel, etc. So, I mean, there is definitely opportunity there, like, and that is where our focus lies at the moment. In addition to like uh, focusing on the more long-term fundamental change in the cost base, which is then a streamlining of the back end while we strengthen the, the front line. Uh, and of course, then we took additional steps in the beginning of the year that will also impact this. So all in all, like this should help. Uh, but I would say like what has changed now uh, is that, I mean, a lot of uh, the things and, and new ways of working have as escalated like uh, and, and we see the opportunities and we see it's like not relevant always to uh, be fly in, flying in and flying out. And, and that's uh, uh, an eye opener, uh, both for us and, and the organization. So that's the part that we need to focus on at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Akash Gupta of JP Morgan. Please go ahead, your line is open. Yes, hi. <coughs> hi, good morning, Arnie, Linda and Tina. My first one is on backlog margins. So if you can comment on margins in backlog compared to the gross margins that we have seen in the last couple of quarters. I mean, last year we saw a big step down in Q4 performance, but you also had some inefficiencies and just wondering if there are any similar risk uh, that we should be aware of this year. Yeah, so general, the underlying margin are improving. It is though a mixture. So, so let's look at, we are seeing more demand now for primary processing and secondary in China. The margins will be a little bit lower there in the primary, not because we are selling at high price, but it is a little bit more cost to do it now. But when we, we develop in, in the next three years, ramping up, the local resources, we will have similar cross margin there. However, in the most part of the world, we are moving to consumer products, that is our secondary processing in USA, in LATAM, in Europe, that is a pretty high cross margin items. And the mix is leaning toward more space uh, and et cetera, that is a high. So underlying all in all, leaning toward more stable, good cross, However, you see that we are at 39% gross now. It is unusually high when we go a bit down in revenues. However, this is where we feel comfortable, 39, 40% gross. So, so overall, if I answer here, underlying trends, they are mixed, but all, all in all, uh, we believe it's rather moving up for compared to recent quarters. Thank you. And my follow-up is on the recently acquired company, Pref. And I mean, they have some non-meat business. 
uh, which kind of reminds us that some of these equipment can be used in, in other industries like bakery, for example. And I just wondering, um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about developing this non-meat business over the period of time and should it mean that we should expect a new food segment which could be dedicated to non-meat opportunity uh, down the line in future? Yeah, so, so like in Thrive, we, uh, and, and we have the bread, we have the cheese, uh, and, and, and we have the ice machines from Maya that is display, displaying all the smoothies and et cetera out in the groceries. We have a weighing technology as well here in, in Maryland, so on. So all in all, the direct shop channel is 50, 60 million now in Maril, and we are definitely going to leverage that. That, that is an end of line, for instance, as well, potential in, in this. You see Walmart now, the, the butcheries are out in USA. It's behind the glass that you see Thrive cutting the meat. You can even order it in the beginning of your shopping, what kind of meat you want but it's not the old butchery style that we used to have, but it's behind the glass. It's a fascinating growth channel, channel the shop channel that we will leverage, and it's, some of it is out, outside of poultry, meat and fish. And then, of course, we are working very closely with alternatives providers in our further processing or, or prepared food segment. It's interesting segment to, and just to once again say it, my, my oldest daughter, she doesn't eat poultry meat and fish, so I have always trouble at home cooking twice the portions for everybody. So I lo look very closely into it. Unfortunately, there is not enough of a healthy ingredients there, but it's moving very fast. So we are targeting that as well, and it's same technology in the forming, and et cetera, so of the burgers. So more or less, but, but uh, it will develop, uh, we have always said, there's no question we will go outside of meat, poultry, meat and fish. We started in fish. Fortunately, we are focused. Now we're in poultry, meat and fish through all the processing steps throughout with gradually expansion. But will we be in, in vegetables? Will we be in cheese and bread? Yes, but it will be gradual uh, movements. And shop channel, 60 million compared to the Marela I knew 2005, that was 130 million. It's pretty exciting growth arena. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Dave Forstellum of ING Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks, operator. Good morning, uh, Arnie and uh, Linda. Uh, yeah, my first question is about uh, the, the meat division. Uh, to get a bit more feel, because you, you're stating that you have a uh, good level of uh, new orders, but if I look at uh, the uh, third quarter revenue level, uh, it's, it's the lowest in the, in the past 10 quarters or so. Uh, so what are your expectations for the fourth quarter, excluding the consolidation of uh, Trife? Will it be lower or, or higher? I know it has a difficult comparison base uh, compared to the fourth quarter of 19. So if you get, uh, get, give us some feeling about uh, what your expectations are for the uh, revenue development in meat, excluding Thrive, it would be, uh, would be helpful. Um, so I, I can start. Uh, so like, you're right. I mean, revenues in, in, in the third quarter were like uh, impacted uh, by seasonality, but also what Altnick commented on in the beginning, like we didn't need to uh, drive things uh, faster because our delivery was uh, in good shape. Uh, so we ended at this level on, on the revenue side. Uh, what we do see uh, for the fourth quarter, of course, it's, uh, we don't want to guide uh, quarter and quarter, but I would expect revenues to be at a, at a higher level than we see now in, in, in Q3. Um, and, um, and like, I mean, revenue at this level during a pandemic where we also see some limitations of getting to the customer. Um, of course, we, we are very focused on delivering uh, higher revenues, but uh, it's at a, at a decent level at the moment, I would say, and, and expectations that it will be slightly higher in, in, in Q4. Okay, that's, uh, that's very helpful. And maybe to add to it, to give you insight into the dynamics and difference between meat and poultry as it stands now. We are having higher mix in aftercare revenues in poultry than in meat, very fast running through. We are having much higher mix in, in secondary processing in poultry now than in meat, high gross short cycle there. 
And if we look at the primary processing in poultry and meat, it takes around nine to, to 80 months to deliver the poultry. It's very seldom that the customer asks us to delay installation. While the delivery in meat is 12 to 24 months, sometimes the customer asks us for, for delays. Uh, as you know, there is less standardization modelization as well in, 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 in meat than, uh, than in poultry, and we are learning from poultry. We need to move even faster, and we need to cross sell and upsell more. Why am I saying this now? It is because it was soft order intake in, in meat in recent quarters, Africa swine flu, and, and soft even second quarter, very good third quarter with a better mix, but you go first in engineering phase in meat for three to six months before you start to see revenues out of that when it's much shorter cycle in, in the poultry. So orders starting to pick up, China picking up, mix improving in meat, but the time lag until it goes into revenue is, is much longer than in, in poultry and fish. Just to pinpoint that, so the short cycles uh, are very important and, and the aftercare business. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, one one follow-up on the uh, the inventory levels. I noticed you on purpose uh, keeping them higher, so in order to protect your uh, standard uh, delivery times. Uh, so we can also assume that, that to be the case in the fourth quarter, so that inventories are on an absolute level quite quite high, also at the end of the fourth quarter. Uh, yeah, so like during this year, we have been focusing on having uh, availability of parts uh, in, in excellent shape, and that has really helped us uh, during this period, <coughs> you see that inventory levels have been going up. Uh, I'm not expecting some uh, huge change between quarters, but like uh, we have the capabilities and uh, financial uh, capabilities to uh, invest in this, and, and, and we look at it as an investment because it is really facilitating that things are going smoothly, and uh, we will continue that as, as long as uh, we need. Yeah, okay, clear. Thank you. Okay, and I'll hand back to the room for an emailed question. Okay, so we have a question from Arnar Bjarnason from Reykjavik Capital, and the question reads, do you see bread cutting continue to be a significant activity of the tribe business, or will you consider to divest that part of your business in the future? Yeah, Arnar, thank you for the question. I, I know you know you, and I know you are from Iceland. I challenge you to go to all the bakeries and see the bread cutting. It's in every second bakery here, and high-end bakeries. You see as well the, the nicely cut, uh, cut meat and et cetera in the bakeries. We are on the forefront here, and when we take it as well to Walmart, Costco, and etc., it's, it's part of our, our shop channel, and we will continue to leverage this. And like I said, the shop channel is 60 million, and it's a sizable business that we are having, and we will leverage this going forward. Okay, um, if there are no other questions on the conference call, I think... Uh, we've had two further questions come through, if you have time to take them. Okay, perfect. The uh, next question comes from the line of Eric Wilmer at uh, ABN Amro Bank. Please go ahead, your line is open. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, question on fish. Uh, it seems that in absolute terms, sales within the fish division uh, were at a four-year low, uh, whereas the EBIT margin wasn't that bad uh, at all. Uh, I was wondering if you could give some more color on that margin. This is, for example, driven uh, by a higher share of aftermarket sales or perhaps a bigger uh, secondary processing share. Thank you. Uh, to be honest, then, then we, we are seeing a lower volume that is taking down the margins and then we are seeing better execution that is improving the margin, but we have a tailwind in fish in, in currency as well. So, so we need more volume to, get, to step up in the profitability, first stop at around 12% and then go above 15%, but it's, a, it's more volume when we have the solution there. We are not going to slow down our, our investments. We are at the forefront in tilapia and the farming. We are seeing 
very interesting pipelines we are seeing as well installation in, in the tilapia industry. We are definitely at the forefront in the white fish after we closed the, the application gaps in, in, in the primary. And we are, we are having this fascinating solution in consumer ready, bone free solution. And then we need to close some uh, application gaps in the beginning of the salmon because there is a renewal of salmon factories coming up next year. So, so all in all, outlook good, but like I said, I'm, I'm a bit surprised because financial strength is high by many of our fish customers. Why being so cautious in moving forward in investing so you have more flexibility between channels? But so it's a mixture up and down in, 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 in the margin volume uh, and better execution, but there is a tailwind in currency, although there is not tailwind overall in Marl in currencies. Oh, thank you uh, for, for that. And if I may, just as a quick uh, follow up on the Tribe acquisition, uh, will the Tribe brand name be kept? And if, is it possible to qu quantify any synergies from, uh, from these acquisitions? Yeah, so overall, Maril is the employee umbrella that unites us on the vision and values. But Thrive is a very strong uh, brand as well. Like I said, the, the animals and the birds, the puma, the falcons and etc. on the product is a very strong, uh, pro strong product names. So this is one of the most fascinating marketing exercises we have done. Uh, in the shop channel, will it be different than, uh, than in the poultry meat and fish factories and so on? We will clarify this in beginning of next year. We are working very well, very professionally in this, but the overall umbrella is Marl. Okay, Thanks. and perhaps on, syner on synergies? Lastly? Synergies don't count any cost synergies, although they are the mo much more exciting to drive the geographical presence and aftercare market and then the full line offering in meat. We are doubling the standard human sales in meat. So don't embed in your model cost synergies, but we, of course we will have clustering effect, innovate more, penetrate more and sell more. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question in the queue comes from the line of Andre Mulder of Kepler. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Good morning. Um, uh, first, a question on your M&A activity. Um, you're, of course, in, in, in a good position with, uh, with your financial ratios. Um, are there any possibilities that the current uh, challenging market conditions offer in, in terms of M&A? Are there more... Uh, acquisition targets available at, at, at good uh, prices? Yeah, so the, in, in the m and world, like I described, uh, that I saw first time uh, uh, Thrive 206, we have been working very closely with them for five years, discussing not them, with the owner and principal. And now in recent six months, in, in a very good discussion to finalize this, because we saw that we had the same vision in digital platform. We had more economic scale. We invest 80 million in innovation every year, while they had 80 million in revenues total. So there are many, many good family-run companies out there that are innovative, reliable, standard modules, lacking the global reach and digital platforms. We are ready uh, in our minds, we are ready in our organization and financially we are definitely ready with strong margin, strong cash flow, leverage of one times EBITDA at the moment when our target is two times and we can go up to three times uh, when we take on uh, high quality companies. So, so, but needs two for Tango, yes, there are very many good family run companies that have been around for 40, 50 years. So exciting times ahead, but we need to do it gradually. Fortunately, we are not plug and play consolidator like many of the US are. I believe we should stop then, but we are improving always how we are doing it. And we always go to learn a lot. Now we are taking 100 days to learn about Thrive. They are learning as well about our digital platform and the global reach. And then we will synchronize step by step by step, first the front end and then the back end.
running out of time in, 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 in this conference call. Right. I think there are no more uh, questions on the uh, conference call. Uh, many interesting questions raised here today. I sincerely thank you all for your time, your attention and continued support for Morel. And I hope to see you back here in a few months' time for our fourth quarter results. Thank you and goodbye.